Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including... CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiaki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiaki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a place where science and magic come together to transform fact into evolving truth. We're proudly coming to you through the ever-expanding X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, and can also be found on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring Full Circle. History is written by the victors, reality dictated by the powers that be. We've seen this repeatedly in our short lifetimes. As individuals, we tend to rewrite history to suit our self-portrait rather than render an accurate accounting. That being the case, we can only imagine how distorted so-called history has become over the ages. In a college psychology class of 120 students, my professor staged a robbery. A grad student in a trench coat, Richard Nixon mask, unmatched shoes, and red checkered pajamas held up our instructor in front of the class took his wallet, and left. As soon as it was over, the prof instructed us to write down what we had witnessed. Out of 120 students, no two renditions were the same, and not one of us noted that the perpetrator accosted the instructor with a banana rather than a gun. If 120 relatively intelligent college students can't get their story straight less than five minutes after an incident taking place on a stage in front of them, What does that say about accurate accounting of history over the ages? When suffering through various history classes, I couldn't help but notice what was being touted as truth simply did not add up. To this day, we can't reproduce the precise construction of the pyramids at the Gaza Strip. Yet, we're supposed to believe the mammoth stones were dragged into place and positioned, without so much as a razor space between them, by slaves with ropes and ramps? Uh, Sorry, not buying it. And what about the statues at Easter Island? 
The Moai are monolithic human figures reportedly carved by the inhabitants of Easter Island in eastern Polynesia between 1250 and 1500 AD. The production and transportation of more than 900 statues is a real puzzle, as some are 33 feet high and weigh 82 tons. What's the likelihood this was accomplished by primitive peoples with no advanced machinery? The Mayan calendar is supposed to be the most accurate calendar in existence. Calendrical timing, this precise, is dictated by many things, including relative positioning in the galaxy. Yet, the knowledge of the solar system and galaxy required to produce, to produce such accuracy was supposed to have been obtained by Mayan people during a time without even so much as a telescope? I've always had a sense we were by no means as advanced as we've been in times forgotten, that we cycled through this process many times before. Maybe, just maybe, the reason we fail to find a missing link is because there isn't one. Instead, what if we evolved not from apes, but from the remnants of our last self-perpetuated demise? We've defined our reality around common denominator historical belief systems. Culture and religious beliefs have been established and wars waged over supposed historical facts. If indeed our historical details are grossly inaccurate, what does that do to our reality? What effect will it have on beliefs and cultural mores? What would such a radical reframing do to societal stability, to economics, or to established governments? Discovery of a massively false history would rival the reality shift required to perceive the world as round rather than flat, or that the earth indeed circles the sun. In times past, history is to be believed people were burned at the stake for such heresy. But if we are indeed coming full circle and in the process of another cyclic crash, can we afford not to discover we've been here before and where it leads? Can we afford to stick our heads in the sand to preserve the status quo and blindly create a rerun? Hopefully our guest this hour can help shed some light on the subject. Frank Joseph is the author of The Lost History of Ancient America, and he was the editor-in-chief at American Magazine from this inception in 1993 until his retirement in 2007. After this commercial break, I'll introduce Frank, and together we'll take a closer look at evidence discrediting our current view of history. Could be revolutionary, so don't go away. You're listening to The Science of Magic, thescienceofmagic.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. 
Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com. This is Johanna Carroll, host of Dialogue with Divinity on the Exxon Broadcast Network. While walking along Kanapali Beach in Maui this past year, I kept discovering all these shells and coral in the shape of hearts. My Dialogue with Divinity was very simple. Do you want me to do a retreat to heal people's hearts in Maui next year? And of course, the answer was yes. As a master spiritual teacher, I am offering you a neat retreat called Rise, May 8th through the 12th, 2017, and the chance of a lifetime to rest at a five-star resort for five days and experience a spiritual renewal of your heart and soul. Kanapali is one of the top five beaches in the world. This stunning resort has undergone a $40 million renovation. I walked the entire property, checked out the room choices on your behalf, and I must say it is stunning. Our conference room faces the ocean with sliding glass doors. Maui is known as Mother Maui because it is a soft, gentle, healing energy. In the embrace of Mother Maui, you will feel yourself rising from the limitations of an ordinary life to an extraordinary journey of peace, bliss, and harmony a greater sense of clarity. Our RISE retreat ignites renewal in the sacred elements of air, water, earth, fire, and wind. There's plenty of free time to enjoy all that Maui has to offer. A small deposit is required now to reserve your space as this retreat, it will sell out. For more details, please go to johannacarroll.com and register today. Aloha, and I'll see you in mystical Maui. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness, I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Frank Joseph, the author of Lost History of Ancient America. He's authored 36 published books, mostly concerning alternative science and history, released in many foreign language editions. Joseph today lives with his wife, Laura, Norwegian forest cat Sammy, in the upper Mississippi River Valley. His website is ancientamerican.com. Frank, thank you for joining us on The Science of Magic. Well, oh, thank you so much for allowing me to uh, follow that superb uh, introduction. I guess I, I can hardly add to that. It was just very beautifully composed and spoken, and uh, I'm very grateful for such a wonderful introduction. Oh, thank you. It's it's really nice to have you here. Uh, tell me, what drove you to the study of alternative history? Well, I suppose it was my uh, failed education or my failing at education. <laughs> One of the two probably combinations of both. Um, I went to Southern Illinois University back in the 1960s. That seems like ancient history in itself. <laughs> and uh, I found that uh, the explanations that were given to me by my uh, anthropology and archaeology teachers uh, just uh, didn't make sense logically um, for a number of the reasons that you so beautifully brought up in the introduction. Just too many uh, contradictions going on. Um, and I found it difficult to believe, uh, for example, like the Norse, uh, the Vikings, who had this superb uh, maritime technology. Uh, the, the ships that they built are unrivaled even today for open sailing vessels. And these vessels are so hardy and uh, so beautifully made that they could take these people anywhere in the world. And there was nothing to stop them. And yet uh, we were told, even when I was going to school, that the Vikings never made it to North America at all. And it was only in the 1960s, the early 1960s, that a place called Lansom Meadows uh, in, in Labrador, that uh, Newfoundland, that uh, proof finally came to light of a Viking settlement there. 
And uh, even at that time, when this tremendous uh, discovery was made that the Vikings really did make it, Leif Erikson's time about a thousand years ago did make it here to North America, most archaeologists at that time fought tooth and nail against the, the poor, lone archaeologists who were trying to champion this discovery. And uh, since then, archaeologists have had to admit very reluctantly that, yes, it looks like, well, maybe uh, some freak accident brought uh, these Vikings here to North America. And, but since that time, since the 1960s, there have been a huge number of discoveries, and we've mentioned some of them in, in this new book called The Lost History of Ancient America, about another Canadian discovery in the Tanfield Valley uh, that indicates that uh, Lansa Meadows, this Norse settlement, was hardly more than an outpost, that the Vikings had numerous settlements up and down the east coast of North America. They penetrated far deeper into the interior, interior of North America than was ever imagined before. And uh, so I think this opened up uh, a whole new uh, view of our past, uh, and has added to the richness, the, the great historical wealth of this land that we live in. And I kind of suspected that, as many of uh, my fellow students did when we were being taught that. And I think that really set me on the course. So I have to thank my education, I suppose, for... That's one of the things that education is, is supposed to do. It's supposed to inspire its students to carry on after they leave school. And I guess in an inadvertent way, they, they did that with... Uh, someone like myself. It actually works. You know, my background is um, in shamanism, and a lot of my shamanic studies, although I've studied shaman shamanic practices all over the world, a lot of them were based in Native American uh, cultures. And my teachers would hand down to me these stories of their history that were oral tradition handed down for generations. And being able to tell these stories accurately was really instilled in the people. And what I found through these stories was renditions of the Vikings being here long before Columbus and all these things that you're talking about in your book. I found it really fascinating the way it crosses over. Have you looked into any uh, comparative mythology that way? Absolutely. I think that, uh, that the track that you're on there with shamanism is incredibly valuable. Uh, this comparison between what people think of as hard history, historical facts, and uh, mythological approaches to life and, and shamanism are separate. They are not. They're intimately intertwined. Uh, Joseph Campbell, the great uh, 20th century, was able to demonstrate that repeatedly. Uh, that it's impossible, actually, to separate what we're trying to find out, um, the historical facts, uh, from the, the motivations of these people that made them want to go to different places and interact. And shamanism is an incredibly important part of that. That's one reason why a number of these peoples that preceded modern European Americans, or, um, Europeans, rather, like Christopher Columbus, the Renaissance uh, European uh, ethic that he brought uh, at the end of the 15th century, while that was so different from those that had preceded him for hundreds and thousands of years. And the difference was that when he landed, he brought with him an intolerant form of uh, Christianity, which insisted that its way was the only way, and that whenever uh, Christians of his time encountered other peoples who were not familiar with Christianity, to no, no fault of their own, were, had chosen other uh, avenues of uh, spiritual uh, paths to follow. And when those paths were encountered by these early Christians, they were demonized, and they were uh, used against these people to conquer them. This is totally different from the so-called pagans that arrived before, long before Columbus, because they found that their forms of shamanism were incredibly similar to the basic forms of shamanism by, of other peoples. There were uh, important cultural differences, to be sure, language and so forth, and approach and art and all these other things. But the core uh, inspiration for shamanism amongst the Vikings, who were incredibly shamanistic people, as you, as you probably know, uh, with their altered states of consciousness, was fundamentally very similar to the Native American tribes that they were encountering. And so for a long time, we're talking, we're actually now be able to see that the Norse arrived here very early on. We're talking like about 900 A.D., and they had impacts. The, the Scandinavians, even after the Viking Age ended, 
they had tremendous impacts on North America from about 900 A.D. all the way up to almost Columbus's time. We're talking like maybe less than 100 years before Columbus arrived here when the last uh, great impact made under King Magnus of Sweden uh, arrived where I am, which is in Minnesota right now. There's something known as the Kensington Runestone. And that during all that time, there were conflicts between sometimes between the Native Americans and um, the Vikings that arrived here. But for the most part, there was not conflict. They got along extremely well. And you, you wonder why. Why was that? Because these two very different peoples. And one of the reasons why they did get along, and probably the most important, was because they both had a spiritual common ground. And that was the shamanism, which is an altered form of human consciousness, regardless of how it's achieved, as you know. Uh, once this altered state of human consciousness is arrived at, um, you're able to make a contact, an individual contact between this world and the next, and you bring back information for your tribe or your people. And that's why shamans were highly regarded in both the uh, Viking societies, the Norse societies, and all of the North American tribes. And uh, I think that the, what you're undertaking there and in, in trying to get in contact with these shamanistic ideas and and uh, dynamic forces is the key to unlocking a lot of the past. Because you have to understand, well, why did these people do that? Why did the ancient Egyptians build the Great Pyramid? Just for kicks or a tomb uh, for some uh, megalomaniac uh, king? No. It was the spiritual underpinnings of all of these structures. If you don't have a spiritual appreciation for uh, these structures that we're seeing, like the Moai you mentioned, the Easter Island, or the Great Pyramid, or the, the Viking impact in America, then these things don't make any sense. And that's why uh, modern archaeologists tend to dismiss all this, because they do not approach these uh, structures with a spiritual point of view. They look at them in a purely, strictly materialistic point of view, and that's why they're, they're not getting it. Uh, you need both, I think. You have to have, be, have to be grounded in science, to be sure. But you also have to be open-minded enough to see that there's a human quality that affects all of, of these cultures we're seeing. And that really adds terrifically not only to our understanding, but our appreciation of the tremendous richness and the great high adventure that was experienced by previous generations of people that arrived here long before Columbus. This is not to take away from Columbus. He was a great man. He, no doubt he was a fabulous navigator, and his achievement cannot be tarnished. It's unfortunate that the people that travel in his wake, of course, uh, didn't have that same sort of um, high-minded and professionalism that, that he brought in opening up the, the continents at that time. So I could <laughs> ramble on, I guess, forever, but it, I think that that's basically what I'm trying to stress and answer your question in an overlong answer is that it's impossible to understand what we're looking at in the past unless we understand, at least have a basic appreciation open mind for the spiritual qualities that motivated people in those days. And the, you know, another thing about shamanism is it's not bound by time or space. So I, the uh, stories that are told are very accurate what, from what I've found. And I think that's because they can literally journey back and get accurate information about what was really going on. Have you thought about that or looked into that at all? Absolutely. And I, I agree with you. I think that these people, when they go into altered states of consciousness, you know, they're not fools or, or lunatics. These are people that it's a, shamanism is a kind of spiritual science, as you know. I think they can bring back incredibly important information. The other thing on top of that, and that's why shamans are so important. They're the, the record keepers. They're like the, the living memory of a people. The other thing is is that the, the information that they bring back is so important to a people that they enshrine this information in myth. In storytelling, how else are a pre-literate people going to uh, carry on those that important information, that high knowledge, unless it's enshrined in some kind of a mnemonic device? This does not mean that um, these myths are just stories or fables. Uh, it, they are just uh, means of preserving information that's extremely important to people. If you peel back the poetry, and that's what the myths are, they're, they're fabulous poems and dramas. If you just peel those layers back, you see the core truth at the basis of them all. And otherwise, 
they wouldn't be around after all these hundreds and thousands of years unless they did enshrine or encapsulate somehow some truth that means a great deal to the people that are preserving these things. Why do we still read uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey that were put down, you know, the Iliad, I guess it was first written out like about 800 B.C., 2,800 years ago, and it was much older than that in an oral form. And that's because it speaks to us still. It enshrines high truths, not just historical facts. And I think that you're right. It's Shamanism is a way of, of a highly gifted person, a highly trained person, to We're going uh, to have transcend to... time and space and bring back this information for us. We're going to have to take a break. Frank and I will return to our discussion after this short break. We're coming to you through the Land of Leading Edge Paranormal Broadcasting, the Exxon Broadcast Network. Don't miss their other fine shows and hosts on xzbn.net. You're listening to The Science of Magic, thescienceofmagic.net. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. We will be back, so don't you go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions 
including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Frank Joseph, author of The History of Ancient America. Frank, we were uh, playing with the fact that the shamanic journey trance and the myths and legends and, and stories that come through the shamanic practice kind of humanize and bring the magic back to historical facts. And yet, is don't you, because there's so much myth in, and um, not myth, but allegory in the shamanic journey information, don't you think that's what makes it so very important to be able to compare it back to archaeological digs and scientific facts so that we can get the full picture? I believe that that is really uh, the future, the good future involved in all this, and that where we're finally beginning to bring back and to, to meld the spiritual and the scientific, that they're not as contradictory as is, was once understood. Uh, there are times when you have to completely separate the two. When one is doing a, a dig, for example, or one is examining the hard evidence, you have to temporarily put aside the uh, shamanic or mythical side. But when you're trying to make sense of it, when you're trying to complete a uh, discovery one may have, or to look at the evidence, the physical evidence, and trying to interpret it and make sense of it, then it is imperative that the spiritual and the shamanic or mytholo mythological uh, contents uh, be brought together. And that's when uh, material comes alive. Uh, that's, that infuses it with uh, uh, a, a human quality that would have been missing otherwise. So I think that uh, what you're, you're talking about is absolutely correct. There's going to be this, or there actually is taking place right now, this melding of both sides. Uh, but it has to be done uh, properly, it has to be done at the right time, it has to be done carefully. And uh, that is happening, that's beginning to happen. That's the good news. You know, um, I've been taken on crime scenes various times and uh, asked to use my shamanic skills because I'm from a family of a lot of police officers and asked to use my shamanic skills to try to read what went on at a scene of a crime. And that same pr process can be used to read what went on at an archaeological site. Have you ever played with that? Well, uh I'm not as anywhere near as talented as you, I'm afraid. Um, but I, the only thing I can do is I can acknowledge and, uh, and honor uh, this shamanic side. And when people like yourself are able to uh, get visions or to feel or see things, then it's, it's for the less uh, gifted person like myself to uh, integrate that information and uh, try to harmonize it. Um, but uh, I think the important thing is, is uh, to recognize that there is this, this real connection between the this, this physical and the spiritual. And I guess it was released not too long ago that the FBI in the United States has a, and has had for a long time a long and growing list of talented persons like yourselves, like yourself in the United States, who are called upon from time to time to solve crimes that they are totally baffled by. So it's amazing what an admission that is to come out, that someone as hard-nosed as the FBI will be able to rely upon people with psychic and shamanic abilities to help them solve crimes. And they do help them solve crimes. Not in every case, but in, in many, time, many uh, instances they do. They bring this information to light. And I think the same process, when applied on a larger scale to archaeology, is going to completely transform our views of the past. And when you, when you do that, when you transform the views of the past, you transform the view of yourself. Because, as you said in the introduction, history, unfortunately, and this is, I guess, human nature, history is just a way of justifying our own actions or trying to explain who and what we are. And 
like anything else, if there's good intention with it, it comes out wonderfully well. If there's bad, well, you can use history to justify subjecting another people or doing terrible things to them. Oh, we did this before, you know, successfully. That's bad. But there are better examples to strive for. And um, I, I think that this connection between the spiritual and the physical that you're involved in is not only incredibly uh, valuable on a, on a crime level, helping people uh, to achieve justice, but uh, it opens up, I guess, this vast panorama of who and what we were and still are. And the more you learn about the past, and the more you learn about the future, where you're going, just like anything else, if, if I was to deprive of you everything that you've known about your life, except until the past couple of weeks, you'd feel lost, you wouldn't be able to plan for the future, be highly disoriented. At the same time, the more experience a person has, the more competent he or she is, and the more confident that person is in the future. It's the same thing, not just with an individual, but with an entire people. And that's yeah, that, why archaeology that's, that's is so an, valuable. That's, that's such an important concept. I mean, um, if we are believing in an erroneous history, our, our reality is torqued. What do you think is the most single impactful alternative his, historical concept? What do you think is the one that's going to impact us the most when it becomes mainstream? Boy, that's a, a really difficult question, and it would be wonderful to, to ponder that. Uh, but I, I think, uh, I, I really, I, you know, to be quite honest, I can't answer that question because it's a, it's a huge, beautiful question that really needs to be thought of. And when we're finished here, I'm going to have to think about that and be better prepared <laughs> for next time. But I, the only thing I can do is from my own little perspective, I think that if... Well, what is happening now? I, I've been really blessed with this. A number of these ancient American books that I've written, not this one so far, but previous ones, have been uh, picked up as textbooks in a number of schools. And I can't tell you how That's great. gratifying that is. Yeah, the Rosen Publishers has picked up a couple of previous volumes, and they're actually teaching this alternative history in a number of schools in the United States now. And I think when that happens, I think... It'll have a lot of great things. First of all, history is so boring to most kids. It's taught in such a, well, it's taught in such a politicized way, and, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be, and it doesn't really relate to, to kids or young people. But when they, when they grasp the adventure of it, I think that it will open up the enti an entire academic world for them, because they think, wow, God, uh, this is so interesting. Maybe these other subjects are cool, too. I've had uh, a couple of presentations in, in high schools and even grammar schools, and I, I've emphasized the adventurous aspects of this, the Vikings um, having to go through tremendous storms and great difficulties, and then finally arriving here and seeing this totally strange and different people. And you know, rather than coming to, to blows right away, they, they began to trade, and then there was uh, conversations begun through sign language and so forth, and they found that there was certain spiritual beliefs that were in common. I mean, this is, you know, when I, when I shared this, you know, the kids really be, were galvanized by the story. They'd never heard this before. Of course, their teachers were angry at me for bringing up all this, all this nonsense, but now the kids will go out and start reading up on Vikings and so forth. So I think that can be highly transforming. Imagine an entire generation of, of people that are now really excited about learning about something instead of just... Uh, you know, watching MTV or whatever they do now and plugged into their computer games, really fascinated by uh, the origins of their people again. Uh, I think that's that could be really transforming. I mean, that could really uplift a, a whole generation. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to, to do in my own very small way, but I think that can, that can have a tremendous impact on the future. It, what what effect do you see the alternative histories having on our society and belief systems? Do you think it'll be very disruptive, or do you think we can slide it in slowly? Well, I hope it's disruptive. I hope that it <laughs> causes as much trouble as possible, because uh, if it's just as uh, smoothly, and then people might take it for granted. Like we need controversy. We need people to really be offended by a lot of things. I mean, we need people to discuss these things and get excited about them. I think that can. That's how revolutions are made, and uh, it's 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 good that there is some dynamic aspect to this, and uh, that's why it's a funny thing when we started our magazine, Ancient American, uh, more than twenty years ago, we got a lot of criticism uh, from uh, academics, of course, you know, and 
We still do, but uh, now we realize that that criticism and that skepticism is very good because it makes it controversial and it keeps us up to the mark too because we'll make mistakes. We'll, make, we'll say things that are, are patently wrong and we have to go back and correct those things. And it's the skeptics that point these things out. So it's good that you've got this fierce dialogue going on. And uh, I hope more of that continues. And I, we really have seen uh, the change, both the academics and ourselves. We have corrected those statements uh, that were false that we would say from time to time and get trapped into. And the academics, too, have changed. When we first came out with our magazine in 1993, Ancient American, the, the paradigm, the un alterable paradigm of the uh, establishment was nobody was in North America before 12,000 years ago. Nobody. Impossible. That's the line in the sand. And they that had been a paradigm accepted for many, many years, decades. Now the evidence, especially the DNA evidence, has pushed that further and further back until now the accepted date for Americans being the earliest Americans has been pushed back to nearly 14,000 years. Now, that's a lot. 1,500 to 2,000 years earlier, and now there's even questions about that going on. So I think that we have made uh, terrific, and not just uh, ancient American, but others like ourselves have made terrific inroads in, in bringing about this change. I, I see this happening. I think there's going to be a, a major set of breakthroughs coming up, especially with the advance of DNA science and so on that are proving that the Native Americans are a people that have a lineage that goes much further back. I mean, we're talking about tens of thousands of years further back than is accepted today. You know, my, my teacher, one of my original teachers was Lakota, and he always told me that the blood will tell. And he was talking about the DNA, that, that what I teach my people is what I need to teach my people because my people were different than his people, but it's in the blood. That's what we're talking, isn't it, is this, this track of DNA that goes across the ages. That's a big part of it, absolutely. They're finding, well, the big uh, DNA uh, study that took uh, over five years to complete was of all the Native American tribes in Canada and North America. They didn't go below the Rio Grande uh, because there's been uh, so much mixing uh, down there that it's very difficult for the DNA uh, to get the same kind of uh, trace elements here. But in, in North America, above the Rio Grande, Canada and the United States has been a lot less uh, intermixture, and so the DNA is, it works more properly. And it's been discovered that, yes, uh, a majority of Native American tribes, the majority, uh, did migrate uh, from Siberia into what is now Alaska, oh, anywhere between about uh, 13,000 and 11,000 years ago. However, uh, the remaining 15, sometimes as much as 20% I've seen of the DNA, shows traces from Western Europe and the Near East. Now, this news, which has been out for what, eight years or so, uh, has not percolated into the news media yet. I mean, that's a big story, but I've never <laughs> seen it on you know, CBS or any of these other major networks, but it's been established scientifically through genetic testing that many of the Native American tribes have European or Near Eastern ancestry and sometimes Asian ancestry we're going to have go to back pick, long we're to, before. We're going to have to pick up on this subject on the other side of another break. Um, Frank and I will be back shortly. You're listening to The Science of Magic, thescienceofmagic.net, the place where altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric create common ground for the betterment of our world. We're brought to you by the leader in paranormal, spirituality, alternative health programming, the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. We'll see you on the flip side. As host of Dialogue with Divinity, I am thrilled to join the Exxon Broadcast Network and their growing number of affiliates. My quest for a connection to the divine 
ignited my successful career path as an international spiritual counselor for over 40 years and author of four books and well-known metaphysical educator. My clients call me their spiritual mama. So my job is to offer you a radio show to help you grow spiritually with wisdom and get specific tools from guests who are experts in their field. Tune into Dialogue with Divinity and be part of the conversation with spirit. My goal, your happy soul. For more information, please visit my website at johannacarroll.com. Coming soon to the Exxon Broadcast Network is a different perspective with me, Kevin Randall, as your host. We'll be taking a close look at what is happening in the world of UFOs today with side trips into the paranormal. Guests will range from those who are household names to those who have a different perspective on a variety of topics. No topic will be taboo, but there will be tough questions asked as we all search for the truth about UFOs, the paranormal, and those things that excite us. Sometimes we'll agree with a guest and sometimes we won't, but we'll try to keep the program topical. For those of you who would like to read, be sure to visit www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and remember to listen to the other fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network at www.xzbn.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. And our guest this hour is one of those people of gifted service to the world, Frank Joseph, author of The Lost History of Ancient America. Frank, I want to get into a whole different subject here just because it's so fun. If you don't mind, talk to me about Atlantis and Lemuria legends. Well, it's not all that different, actually, because uh, we're talking about the the origins, the motivations for uh, peoples and cultures that did go around the world. And where did it all start? Where did it all come from? And that actually is one of the questions that I was really interested in uh, long ago. What are the origins of civilization? And uh, I found that the conventional explanations for them were very inadequate. They they mostly are seen as inadequate even by uh, academics. And uh, I came across uh, a, a, a dialogue, a set of dialogues by the very great philosopher Plato, who is regarded today, even today, as 
one of the most outstanding minds of Western civilization. The, the ethics that he set down for us are, are, are still in use. And about uh, uh, 350 B.C., uh, he talked in two of his dialogues, the Critias and the Timaeus, about a civilization, a, a kingdom that flourished on a large island, not a continent, by the way, a large island. He referred to it as a nasos, it's Greek for island, that flourished in the Atlantic Ocean long before Greece or even Egypt came into existence, and that the civilization was blessed with um, beautiful climate and the conditions were uh, ideal for the origins of civilization. And unfortunately, over time, uh, this large island suffered a natural catastrophe which destroyed this society. However, the survivors of this catastrophe uh, migrated to various parts of the world, uh, still in possession of their high culture, and sparked civilization elsewhere. That is the story in a nutshell. Wow. He refers to this place as Atlantis. The name is very interesting. It's not a Greek name uh, as an indication of how old this place was and, and how non-Greek it was. It's a Sanskrit word uh, meaning the daughter of the upholder. Um, the actual name of the island itself was Atlas. Uh, and in, in Sanskrit, that means he who holds up. In other words, uh, it's a description of what Atlas was supposed to be. He was a mythological conception of a man supporting on his shoulders uh, the zodiac, the globe of the heavens, the sphere of the heavens. He's portrayed now uh, incorrectly as supporting the world on his shoulders. That was not the original concept at all. And that's because he was regarded as the founder of astrology and astronomy. The two were uh, inextricable in ancient times. Astronomy is nothing more than the observation of heavenly bodies, and astrology is the spiritual interpretation of, of the relationship of those heavenly bodies to human behavior and activities. And uh, Atlas was the uh, the founder of this, the uh, mythological founder of this. Wow. And uh, so I, when I read this story, I thought, wow, that's a, is that just a legend? Is that just a fable? Or is there something to it? And so I devoted um, the years between, well, I guess I started getting interested in this in uh, 1980 until the present time. I've been studying it that long. I've traveled around the world trying to find clues to this culture, and I found many clues to it. And uh, so I, I became convinced over time, as many other uh, investigators have, that this is a, a uh, legendary telling of an absolutely historical event that took place, and that our origins as a civilized people uh, were on this, on this uh, island in the near Atlantic uh, going back many thousands of years ago. That's just um, fascinating, isn't it? You know, yes, there's been, and there's been so many different reports of it. It's just, you know, when you hear it over and over again, you've got to start looking. You know, Frank, before we get too far into this last segment, would you mind telling people where they can find your wonderful books and services? Well, uh, you did mention um, our website, which is uh, ancientamerican.com. Uh, my books are available there. Uh, if anyone is interested in purchasing a copy, there is uh, a 24-hour telephone number they can call. It's a 651 uh, five six. I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong number. I gave you the wrong. <laughs> that number. That number's been changed. It's a toll-free number. It's eight seven seven four nine four zero zero four four. And uh, this latest book is called uh, The Lost History of Ancient America, and uh, it's I believe it's sixteen bucks. And we can get that out to anybody that that's interested in it. But the uh, website that uh, features a number of my books, and I would urge people, if they're interested, that uh, they can order directly through our magazine. Fantastic. You know, comparative mythology has uncovered an amazing number of cultures across the globe reporting the Great Flood. Do you think the Earth has seen the rise and fall of human populations and cultures, like during the myth of the Great Flood, more than once? Well, there's no doubt about it. We live on an extremely dynamic planet. Well, look, even in our own time, uh, in uh, 2010, we have this tsunami that... Uh, overwhelmed uh, parts of Japan and was responsible for the deaths of thousands of people and the destruction of uh, local infrastructure. So there's no doubt that uh, living on such a, uh, a live planet, such a, uh, a planet in flux, 
that uh, there are definitely going to be times when cultures have been impacted by these things. And when that happens, uh, the survivors remember and they care, they perpetuate, they carry on uh, members of this event. You mentioned the Native American tribes. I don't know of a single Native American tribe, and I've studied and been with a great number of them, that is not aware of the Great Flood that they count their uh, origins from. One of the most convincing comparisons that I found early on was the e Egyptian story of the Great Flood. It was a very great um, a scholar by the name of Manetho, who was an Egyptian scholar who lived about 300 B.C., and he uh, recorded some of the earliest traditions of his people, the ancient Egyptians. And he told about the origins of ancient Egypt. He said that long ago, before there was in Egypt, there was an island uh, beyond the Twelfth Bowl, which was his way of saying that it was outside of the Mediterranean. Um, the Egyptians had a way of marking their maps very similar to our conception of latitude. They referred to them as these semicircles on a map as bows. And uh, beyond the Twelfth Bowl, the Twelfth Bowl corresponded to what today would be Gibraltar, Spain, Morocco, that area. Beyond the Twelfth Bowl, Manetho said there was an island, and it was referred to as Sekret Aru. This story, by the way, is not only in Manetho, it's in a much earlier uh, Egyptian source called the Book of the Dead, very famous uh, a compilation of prayers and so forth. And Sekret Aru is mentioned in the Book of the Dead, and that goes back, oh, gosh, that's about 4,000 years ago or more. And on Sekret Aru, uh, human beings and gods supposedly lived together and created a fabulous kingdom, the first kingdom. But over time... These people became so arrogant that they assumed that they could uh, live without the gods, didn't need them anymore. The gods punished Sekret Aru by sinking it into the sea. And only a few people, according to Manetho in the Book of the Dead, uh, were able to survive this catastrophe. They sailed to what is uh, now the Nile Delta, and they transformed that area by bringing the high magic and technology of Sekret Aru to the natives of the Nile Delta, and the synthesis that resulted was Egyptian civilization. Now, what's interesting about that story is that not only does it sound like Atlantis, it also coincides with other uh, origin tales from other parts of the world. Sekret Aru in Egyptian, it means field of reeds, R-E-E-D-S. And a reed was considered, uh, was used as an ink pen. You would snap off a, a reed and you dip it in ink and you could write with it as a pen. And so to possess a reed meant that you were literate. And a field of reeds is a poetic metaphor for an extremely highly literate place. If you have a whole field of reeds, that means you have a lot of people that know how to read and write. So it's for wisdom. On the other side of the world, thousands of years later, the Aztec people said that they originated on an island in the Atlantic, which they referred to as Atslan. And Atslan was also this high kingdom that suffered a natural catastrophe from which the feathered serpent and his people arrived on the shores of Mexico. They created a synthesis with the local people of the technology they had to create Aztec civilization. The thing about that is that story is so similar to Sekret Aru, but then when we get to the name of Atslan, what does Atslan mean? Atslan means field of reeds, oh, exactly wow. the same as Sekret Aru in ancient Egyptian. And it meant exactly the same thing because the Aztecs and their Mesoamerican uh, predecessors also used reeds as writing pens. So what are we to make of this comparison? And believe me, it is not the only one. When you multiply that, by dozens, maybe hundreds of other traditions around the world, they affirm, they confirm a story about a place that existed in the Atlantic Ocean of high culture that suffered a natural catastrophe and its survivors spread its technology around the world. So I think that the story of Atlantis, if I could bring it into a court of law, I could bring in a guilty verdict on the truth easily through the circumstantial evidence. Admittedly, the body is missing. But the technology that's now being developed in undersea research will someday, I feel absolutely confidently, someday, and probably in this century, will reveal the physical remains of this place. I think that's inevitable. That's going to happen. Well, I look forward to it. And, and we are out of time. It does oh. fly. And I can't thank you enough for being on the show with us. The pleasure was all mine.
Our guest this hour has been Frank Joseph, author of The Lost History of Ancient America, his website, ancientamerican.com. This has been The Science of Magic. Remember, you can always listen to past thought-provoking episodes on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. Don't forget to join us on the next episode of The Science of Magic. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge, comforted with love, as you entertain the possibility of a different past and its implications for our future. <laughs>